From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Oli. Nice to be with you at the slightly earlier time of 1 p.m. this afternoon. I hope you're well. It's the Richie Allen Show live on Fab Radio 2 here in Manchester. Triggerwarning.tv, my own website, richieallen.co.uk. I've got an interesting hour lined up for you. Thanks for joining me. It's that Richie Allen Show on Twitter, as you know by now. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Right, welcome to the programme. Later this hour, I'll be joined live by Alethea Williams, the Communications Officer for the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. And this is to discuss a very serious situation which developed last week when a woman was ordered to have an abortion by a judge who deemed her mentally incompetent and not in any position to raise a child of her own. This was a ruling handed down last Friday. Subsequently, that ruling has been overturned, thankfully, and the young woman who will give birth to her child will be cared for, and the child will be cared for by the grandparents, the maternal grandparents. But how could we get to that stage? How can a judge say that it is ordered that somebody has an abortion? We're going to talk to, as I said, Alethea Williams, the communications officer of the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children because I think that's a massive issue that and it is worth exploring in depth and we'll do that later on this hour. Before that though lots for you and me to talk about. Muggy and humid old day it is here in Salford. Didn't have any problems with the newspaper live stream this morning uploading to YouTube. It's done it automatically and it's there. If you want to catch that at any time it's on youtube.com forward slash Richie Allen Show. All right? All right. Lots going on, so let's jump into it. Prime Minister's Questions has just finished at Westminster, and I was interested in watching it because I had heard that Jeremy Corbyn would get stuck into the government and the Prime Minister about arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Of course, he didn't really get stuck into her. He just brought it up. You will know that the High Court recently ruled that there should be an inquiry into the government's decision to continue to sell arms to Saudi Arabia while the United Nations and other human rights organisations have said that war crimes on a massive scale are being committed by the Saudi government. So at the High Court last week, it was ruled that there must be an immediate inquiry into these sales to Saudi Arabia. All right? Would you believe that Theresa May said that, well, ministers were disappointed with the finding of the High Court and will appeal? May said, lying through her teeth, that the UK's arms export control regime is one of the most robust in the world. No, it isn't. It isn't. The UK will sell to any man, woman or child without without any or even the slightest interest as to why and how those arms are going to be deployed couldn't care less. Corbyn said to me, do you believe there are serious ongoing violations by the Saudi Arabian regime in Yemen? Yes or no, says Corbyn. May wouldn't give a one word answer, saying the government is holding meetings to determine what's going on, blah, blah, blah. See, Corbyn could, I mean, he would be thrown out of parliament for one day and he might have to pay a fine. I don't know how it works, but Corbyn could look across the dispatch box and say, you are a war-mongering fucking psychopath, aren't you? That's all he has to say. You know, because it's the truth. You're a lunatic, aren't you? Aren't you, Mrs May? Yeah, he might be thrown out by Burko. There might be repercussions. But I mean, what's he got to lose, really? It's boiling in France and in Spain. Some schools have closed in Paris. The temperatures are so warm. Caroline's mother is in Nancy. That's the future, Mrs Allen. And they're baking there on the East Coast. Everybody's baking. And speaking of temperatures, climate justice activists have attended Westminster today. They're protesting 
It's dreadful, this, isn't it? It's relentless. There's no end to it. Please, if you get a chance, I, I put it on YouTube independently. My conversation with the astrophysicist and mathematician Valentina Zharkova from Northumbria University. I spoke with her yesterday. She's debunked this climate change nonsense and has mathematically proven that we're going to enter a period of cooling in the next 30 to 40 years. And there's no challenge to any of this, just a parade of people on the media saying we're all going to die if we don't fundamentally change our lives. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, is amongst these protesters today at Parliament. Rowan Williams, he was interviewed by Sky News. What's he doing there? I think everybody is now aware, as they probably weren't even six months ago, of the urgency of pressing governments to take decisive action to bring down our emissions and also to look at the wider issues of biodiversity, pollution and so forth across the world. It's important that faith communities are rallying to this also in a new way. And you'll see today a very wide representation of different religious communities here, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist and so on, all joining to say we actually are confident that it's possible to take the decisions, the political decisions, necessary to reduce our carbon emissions, to bring us to a stable state by 2050, which is the last date we can really manage it. Why is this now a more pressing, more urgent uh, problem than it was than when you were in Lambeth Palace? That's not the question to ask him. Why is it more pressing now than when you were the Archbishop? The question to ask him is, what the fuck do you know about it? What do you know about climate change? But of course, it has been decreed that the science is settled. There's no need to question any of it anymore. So ask him asinine questions like, what has changed since you were the Archbishop? In the last 10 years, we've seen more and more evidence about the actual practical effects of climate change in different parts of the world. When I was Archbishop of Canterbury, one of the things that was most powerful for me was talking to some of my colleagues from the Pacific Islands, where rising water levels are making so many areas uninhabitable. And the sense that climate change presses most heavily on those least able to adapt or resist the most vulnerable communities. That, I think, is what's given me personally a sense of greater urgency. Yeah, it's incredible. I've talked quite a bit about this. Vulnerable groups, vulnerable communities. They're selling climate change by way of saying there are vulnerable people around the world in hotspots, vulnerable poor people, and sea levels are rising. We must protect them. Everything these days is vulnerable groups. Ethnic minorities, B-A-M-E, transgender people, vulnerable groups that must be protected. And in order to protect these vulnerable groups, we must transform society unimaginably heretofore, previously unimaginably. We'll leave Dr. Rowan Williams. Prince Charles has become the patron of the Faculty of Homeopathy. He's become a patron of the Faculty of Homeopathy and academics and doctors are losing their collective Shiite. They are going bananas because Charles has become a patron of the Faculty of Homeopathy. The faculty which regulates education, training and practice of homeopathy announced his appointment to mark its 175th anniversary. They're delighted that he's become a patron because allegedly he has been a vocal supporter of alternative medicine in the past. But medical professionals are losing their minds, saying it's obscene, it's obscene, obscene that Prince Charles would advocate this lunacy. So Sky News presenters Sarah Jane Mee and Neil Patterson discussed this earlier on Sky Breakfast. Listen carefully now. These are presenters, alleged journalists. They are not health practitioners, not doctors. And they are discussing Charles becoming a patron of the homeopathy faculty. Sky News. I want to talk about Prince Charles. Uh, he's coming under scrutiny today because he's just been announced uh, as the patron of a homeopathy charity. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know who homeopath what homeopathy is, according to the National Health Service, it's a treatment based on the use of highly diluted substances, which some practitioners claim can cause the body to heal itself. However, uh, the government, the NHS, uh, leading medical advisors uh, every, say that these medical, are... Every medical advisor. ...say that these are dummy treatments. So Prince Charles is coming under attack today for being anti-scientific. He's spoken about this before. He's spoken of his um, admiration for homeopathy. But I mean, the, the principle is basically behind it that water has a memory 
and that if you, you dilute, even when active ingredients are, are, are placed in it and you dilute and you dilute and you dilute, even if there are no atoms of the active ingredient, it still has that effect. This glass of water here, for example, could be used variously to treat goodness knows how many conditions. The, 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 the organisation is the, the Faculty of Homeopathy, and I had to check this, but Prince Charles has accepted mm. uh, the, the offer of the patronage. This guy is not a guest. He's not a contributor. This is the Sky News presenter. Got to say that because you might think he isn't. You might think he's representing the medical fraternity. He's a presenter. The patronage. They do suggest that patients should not use homeopathy on its own for obvious reasons. Mm. They should not eschew conventional me medicine just for homeopathy. However, there are homeopaths out there suggesting that this glass of water can help treat cancer. And I'm sorry, I'm getting really close to swearing at this point in the morning, but it is right, nonsense. And How does he know? And the next king of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is a patron of a charity that advocates this as a medical treatment. Wow. So he's a presenter. He's supposed to be objective. But no, he's telling you it's absolute nonsense. It's dangerous. And I can't believe the King of England to be supports this or takes an interest in this. He doesn't know anything about it, of course. He's saying what he is being told to say. Then the Neil Patterson is his name. He's a jock. Then the main presenter, Sarah Jane Mee, talked about a radio show she'd heard this morning. I heard the same radio show. LBC Radio were talking about this. She heard it because LBC had callers this morning who swore that they had used homeopathy to treat their own cancers and they were still alive. Here's Sarah Jane Mee. It's interesting, driving in this morning, I was listening to LBC and they had a phone in on this. And some people were calling in saying, look, you know, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, for example, mm. and I did not go through NHS treatment, chemotherapy, take, you know, the drugs that were recommended. I use homeopathy and I no longer have breast cancer. So then for some people, they do think that it works. But Good girl, Sarah Jane. That's pretty fair. You know, it doesn't matter. Leave for a side, they work for these organisations. Leave for a side all the bad stuff that they do. Deep down in some of them, there is that little bit of integrity. My co-presenter has gone off on a ridiculous rant with, about this, knowing nothing about it. So I better interject here and say, well, there are people who say that they are alive because of it. What does he say to that? But when you've got the Na National Health Service saying that the principles on which this is based are scientifically implausible. Yeah. You do wonder what Prince Charles was doing, Some, accepting this patronage. Some, ah, you see, she's gone the other way then. She was doing well until she threw that in at the end. So what does he say? Sometimes people get better, and sometimes there are factors other than that, and sometimes people lie. Sometimes people lie. So the woman who phoned in LBC this morning to say that I'm doing much better now, and I basically did away with or didn't participate in the conventional approach to cancer. I didn't take the chemo. I went the other way and I'm still alive, thank God. According to Patterson, she must be telling lies. Do you know, the one counterpoint I would suggest is I know a good few medical professionals who use, um, who use, well, for example, in physiotherapy, use acupuncture. Don't know why it works, but for someone who does, it's a placebo, if anything. Okay, let's... That's a placebo then. She didn't have the chemo, didn't go near it, took some homeopathy, doesn't have cancer, so it's a placebo. I have no idea what Prince Charles really believes. Uh, my friend and colleague, Jean Ann Crowley, has sent me a message about Nelson's. That's right, Nelson's is a homeopathic pharmacy shop frequently visited by members of the royal family. She's absolutely right there. It's the Richie Allen Show. A little bit earlier than usual, coming up for 17 minutes past one. Let's move on. A teenager has been... Um, making the headlines this morning and he's been on every news talk show this morning because he attended his end of school party, his prom, in drag. Xavier Perkins, who's 15, took six hours to get ready, did his own makeup, put on a short pink strapless dress that he designed with the help of a dressmaker, went to his prom at Pride Park Football Stadium in Derby and was so, was so beloved by his fellow pupils that they voted him prom queen. They voted him prom queen. Everybody's thrilled to bits. The virtue signalers of the world were thrilled with this guy and I think they've been sending him messages all morning, the likes of which go something like, thanks so much for giving us this opportunity to virtue signal and to say how wonderful you are. Amazing this story, the way it's being covered. He was on Sky News this morning, Xavier Perkins, 15, 
went to his prom in drag, was given the prom queen accolade. He was on Sky News and he was asked why, why in drag, Xavier? Um, so I'd, I'd been having five years of kind of like... It's wearing your school uniform. School uniform, yeah. Constraints. Um, by the gender stereotypes and um, that wearing trousers, skirts. So I really wanted to mix it up and kind of express like more of me because it's my opportunity to do so at prom with all my friends and my family. Um, I mean, Xavier, we can see some images of the end result, which I understand it took. Did it take around five or six hours to, to, yeah. to look like this? Yeah, about five or six hours because it kind of kept on, because I'm a perfectionist when I do it. So I was trying to like perfect my makeup and it, it kept on going wrong. So it's just like a really like happy moment when I finally got there. Cause it, and I've seen everyone, it was really like heartwarming to know that I'm accepted by people. Yeah, uh, Xavier, I'm sure you had the support of your friends when you were talking to them about doing this, but yeah, still a brave decision, nevertheless. Because Lovely bit of editorialising, it was a brave decision. She hasn't asked him anything about why, because it's taboo. You must accept it now. You see, no journalist on mainstream television or radio will have the courage to go and ask the kid why. Why? Why and when? Why have you been dressing up as a woman in your room? Where, where does that come from? Talk to us about how you got to that um, place. Which, of course, I don't have any issue with at all. Do you remember the good old days when people didn't care? Do you remember the good old days when people did not care? So you get dressed up as a woman, you dress in drag, you are a drag queen or whatever, and nobody cared. Now it's not good enough not to care. You must love this and you must express love for it. You must tell these people how brave they are. You are not allowed to ignore these people. See, the students couldn't ignore this guy when he went to his prom. They couldn't. They had to because they've been conditioned to showing somehow that they accept him. And they were probably killing themselves to take pictures with him. To virtue signal. The presenter won't touch it and won't touch the whole historicity of it. What happened? How? Why? How did you feel? When did you feel? What did you think? When did you think? No. You're brave. You're wonderful. Let's virtue signal. Less, because this did get national attention. It made now, Of course it got national attention. And it made it into all the newspapers. Shani, what did you think when Xavier said, look, this is what I'm going to do for the end of year school prom? You must have had a few concerns. Um, no, my only concerns were, um, as Zav's just said, that he's really meticulous. Um, and I knew that he would um, go to the ball in drag, um, but it was just how we were going to get to that point where he was happy with the way he looked. Yeah, she wasn't concerned about anything that would be said to him because she knows the game is over. Nobody can say anything. She was not concerned about him being bullied at the prom. She knew there was no chance it would happen. Her concern was whether the makeup was going to be right for him because he's a bit of a diva, apparently. Wonderful. Then the presenter, Sarah Jane Mee, gets very, very close to the truth with her next question. Xavier, it's interesting, isn't it? Because drag is big business at the moment. You've got Drag is big business at the moment. RuPaul's Drag Race, which I, yeah. I know you watch and has inspired you. Yeah. You've got Drag SOS coming to Channel, Channel 4 soon. It's everywhere. And, and drag isn't just bit about being fierce and fabulous. It's fierce and fabulous. Is it? What does it mean to you to be able to dress like this? It just means I can be whoever I want and do whatever I want. Like Without ever being challenged about it. I can do whatever I want, be whatever I want, say whatever I want, without ever answering to anybody who might be curious about what it is without ever engaging somebody who might think there's something maybe wrong with it I don't particularly I couldn't care less personally right but what I do care is this being foisted onto people and people being told that they have to signal to this that they have to like this they have to appreciate this and they have to embrace this particularly children in primary schools it's not good, is it? It gives me so much confidence when I'm in drag, like, and it just makes me so happy. And it's like I'm, I'm almost free. Almost free. It's like, it, it sounds silly, but just putting on makeup, hip pads, and of course, it really makes you feel so good about yourself. But then it's a different person. It's, it's just like an out body moment. It's like you can be a different person for a day, and it's so, it's so amazing. Right. I see. Again, a real interviewer, a real presenter would, would, would delve into that. So what is it then? Is it a bit of fun, a bit of fantasy? Or do you think you're a woman? Do you want to be a woman? Do you have homosexual feelings? Do you not? Give us a bit more insight, really, Xavier. But no. 
And Xavier, have you had other teenagers getting in touch with you since this has, has made the national press? Brilliant. The interview descends into farce then and he goes on to talk about what he wants to do to help the LBGTQ plus whatever community. If you don't believe me, check it out. It's on Sky News. This is your Richie Allen Show, 23 minutes past the hour. I'm going to get my guest on. I'm going to phone her up and we'll chat with her about a very serious issue indeed. In the meantime, this is Peaceful Easy Feeling from the Eagles who are in Manchester this evening. Back in three minutes. Right, 26 minutes past one or 25 and a half minutes past one. The Richie Allen Show, Fab Radio 2 here in Manchester at TriggerWarning.tv. And of course, the programme is on the Tune In app. To catch reruns of the programme, go to iTunes or Spotify. This is a very serious pro. Uh, it is a serious program today. It's a very serious issue. This, and talked extensively about this yesterday. A mentally ill young woman was ordered by a judge last week to abort her baby. Thankfully, the decision was overturned on appeal. The woman, who was in her twenties, has the mental age of a child, according to a court, and has a learning disability. The judge gave specialists permission to terminate the pregnancy over fears expressed by doctors that her behaviour might pose a risk to the baby in the future. However, the woman's mother, a former midwife, a Christian lady, appealed the decision arguing that she could care for the child instead. In fact, the woman's mother made this argument before the decision to abort was made. And incredibly, Justice Natalie Leaven ignored the pleas of the grandmother-to-be and said, no, the abortion has to take place. This is under terms laid out in the 1967 Abortion Act. And the order came from an NHS hospital. An NHS hospital trust ordered that the woman's care, um, that, excuse me, that the woman be forced to have this abortion. Thankfully, as I said, it was overturned on appeal on Monday. What's going on here? Let's speak to Alicia Williams, Alethea is the communications officer for the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. Busy woman, and uh, I, I thank, thank you very much for coming on today, Alethea. This is an incredibly serious situation. How do we get to the point that a judge can say to a, to a woman and to her family, well, no matter what you think or say, I'm going to impose an order on you to have a termination. How can that possibly happen? My listeners were flabbergasted that such a decision could even be made in the first place. Yeah, as you say, it's a really shocking situation. And to be honest, I've not seen anything quite like this before either. And I think we're all now asking questions, yes, as to how this happened. And is this sort of thing going on all the time, maybe? Um, I think it's raising serious questions about kind of how people with disabilities, particularly mental disabilities, as in this case, are being treated. Um, so the, the way it kind of happened, as you, as you mentioned, the NHS Trust actually went and petitioned the court to be able to perform an abortion on this young woman, um, arguing that it's in her best interests. And again, as you mentioned, they said it might be in the best interest of the baby, you know, the kind of irony of saying you should kill the baby so that it can't be harmed later. Um, absolutely bizarre. Um, and there's also questions being raised about the judge. So this particular judge, uh, Natalie Levin, uh, she's only recently become a judge. Before then, she was a lawyer, and she was a lawyer very much involved with promoting abortion. So she's represented BPAS, which is one of the biggest abortion providers in the country. Um, she, yeah, she's represented them in all sorts of cases. So the fact that such a, a biased judge was on this case is also really worrying. That's very interesting, because if that's true, and I don't think for a minute you'd come on here and um, tell me anything that isn't true about her particularly. I will look into that, but I'll take your word for it. If that's true, Alethea, well, she should have recused herself, presumably. That's what they do normally, right? Yeah, you would have thought so, yeah. But she didn't. Listeners have been saying to me since yesterday, this is some sort of eugenicist agenda. Now, that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Is it? Is it eugenicist to be saying to a woman, number one, you've got to have a termination. Is that you... Is that a eugenicist um, program? And secondly, what would have happened if they lost the appeal? Am I to understand that the young woman would have been forcibly taken to a place to have a termination? Yeah, it's an interesting question about it? whether it was eugenic. You know, um, I mean, we hope that they, these doctors were genuinely thinking, you know, in this woman's best interest. Though it's really incredibly hard to see how that can be the case. Um, 
I mean, they were saying that she would find it very difficult to go through childbirth and, or a C-section. Um, but um, an abortion at this stage, a late-term abortion, you know, she's 22 weeks pregnant, that would involve some kind of surgery or a form of labor. It would be a very physical, traumatic experience. I mean, a late-term abortion is awful for anyone, you know, even if, they, even if it's what they've chosen. But to force this on somebody... Um, so, yes, I mean, the understanding is that it, it would have happened. And um, the, uh, um, during the appeal, we got some more details as to what this woman was being told. So apparently she was being told she, she would go to sleep and then she would wake up and the baby wouldn't be in her tummy anymore, but they would give her a new doll. Um, and, you know, I was just so sickened when I was reading that. I mean, none of us know exactly what this woman's kind of uh, capabilities are, but um, it's been said she has the kind of um, mental age of a perhaps a six-year-old. You know, a six-year-old child knows what a baby is. Yeah. Um, they know if, you know, if sadly, you know, their mother's lost a baby, they know about that. And in fact, they say now you shouldn't say things like, oh, you know, mummy's lost the baby because um, that just kind of causes confusion. You know, children, children know and children grieve. Um, so to say that she wouldn't, um, wouldn't grieve the death of her baby... Um, it is really worrying that a disabled woman is being talked about in this way as if she wasn't like a, a normal person with, with feelings and uh, normal basic human instincts. That's why listeners are asking about eugenics. That's, why, it, it, that's exactly the reason why that came into it. Is there some... Yeah. Um, and really, I mean, I, I'm not virtue signalling when I say that. I'm, I'm a tough guy, um, Alicia. At least I think I am. Um, I was moved to tears by this yesterday because I hadn't heard that the appeal had succeeded and I got this story yesterday from RT yesterday morning and it devastated me. I couldn't get over it for over an hour. Heart-wrenching stuff. I thought, how could this possibly go on? And then I contacted you and you sent me the mail back saying that it had been overturned. I, I, I was thrilled to bits with that. I'm really concerned that the family are upstanding, law-abiding people, that mum, or I should say grandmother, has is a midwife and she's a Christian woman and a woman of um, good standing and their pleas were just completely ignored yes we know our daughter has a learning disability but she's you know she's she's a healthy girl and she's doing well we look after her and we will look after the baby and that was ignored why why would they ignore that yeah it is it is really hard to believe because particularly even in this case the social worker um, who would be best placed to know the family dynamics and, you know, how it would work looking after the baby. She was saying that, uh, well, sorry, I assume that she um, <laughs> was yeah. saying that the pregnancy should go ahead. So it does seem that this all came from the doctors in this unnamed NHS trust. You know, they just kind of unilaterally decided that it would be in the best interests to, uh, to perform an abortion. And it's just very hard to get your head around that could be, how that could be. As I say, you know, um, an abortion at this stage isn't just pressing a magic button and the baby goes away. Um, it, it would involve a traumatic procedure. Yeah. And, 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 and you made the very valid point that the, the procedure, and I mean, it's, it's horrifying. It, it almost sounds, it almost harks back to the 1930s. And I might get into trouble for saying that. You know, this idea of we'll give you a, a general anaesthetic and then we'll take your child and then you'll wake up and the baby will be gone. And the notion that the woman who, who has a learning disability wouldn't in any way be affected by that. I mean, she, she obviously would be affected by that. She'd be devastated by it. Well, it's, it's, I can't believe it. Alicia Williams is, um, is our guest, and I want to broaden this out. Um, she, I, I'll, I'll put out details to the website of the Society for the Protection of Unborn uh, Children. She's a communications officer, uh, is Alicia. Um, do you think there should be a judicial review of the decision in the first place? Yeah, I think certainly something needs to happen. We need to find out how this could have gone ahead. And I think most importantly now, we need to find out, is this sort of thing happening all the time? I think it's basically only a matter of luck, really, that this came to light. I remember I found the original story that, um, that, the, that the doctors were going to court on Friday. And, you know, I only found it because I, I went like three pages into Google on my, on my normal search yeah. for um, um, kind of abortion-related things. And it wasn't until the weekend when the um, decision had come through that it started getting a bit more coverage. But even then, you might have noticed it was getting more coverage, you know, in America than it was in this country. Um, so it's not the sort of thing people want to talk about. Um, it's also interesting that all the kind of your normal women's groups, feminist groups, weren't talk speaking out against this. 
And you do have to wonder whether they're kind of the kind of support of abortion generally has led to a situation where they don't want any criticism, even if in this case, you know, no pro-choice person should be in favor of somebody being forced to have an abortion. You know, it's against every human rights thing anywhere in the world. It's identity politics. Things are not black and white and shame on pro-abortion whether they are feminists or not, shame on them for not saying, well, hang on a second, you know, let's just get off our particular box, or partic- let's get out of our particular pigeonhole for a minute and look at this case because it's horrendous. You ask a brilliant question, and I hope there are people looking into this. I hope this will be raised in Parliament. Y- you correctly say, Alethea, that it, it's kind of lucky that we know about this because of the secrecy around these decisions. I'd love to know how much has this gone on? Is it going on? And have women been taken to uh, be forced to have a termination against their will because of some you know because they were meant you know deemed to be mentally unwell or deemed to have a learning disability we need to know that for uh, for a start um so the feminists then not coming out in 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 favor of or, or coming out asking questions about this about this young uh, woman a couple of questions i want to ask you because I, i've over the years as a broadcaster Maybe I've taken the coward's way out when it comes to abortion. I've always kind of said, well, look, it's not for me as a man, you know, I I don't want to be in a position where I'm telling women what they should and shouldn't do with their bodies. That being said, I don't like the kind of more liberal approach that we've come to take, not only here in the UK where we are now, but in Ireland, towards abortion. I don't like it. Um, You know, I don't. At the same time, there are circumstances within which I think you know, we might allow a termination. And I know you're probably sick of this, Alicia, but I'll bring it up anyway. That situation where a young girl might have been the victim of sexual assault and become pregnant. I don't like abortion, Alicia, but I can't, I couldn't insist that that young girl carry through that pregnancy. What do you think? Yes, yeah, so that's definitely something that comes up a lot. And yeah. Yeah, I do hear it a lot, but you're right to ask it. It's very important, you know, even if it's only a small percentage of abortions, I think. Yeah. It is very small, hopefully. Um, it is something that needs answering. Um, I think we always have to kind of um, think about, you know, what abortion is and does it, does it help women? Um, you know, from listening to women who have been through this, I think, I think most of us would instinctively think, oh, a woman who's been through that awful, awful situation wouldn't want the baby. It's a, it's a reminder, all those, all those things you hear. But that's not actually what you hear a lot of the time from women who have been through this. Um, I, I heard recently from this uh, amazing woman, she just come over from America, she was um, raped in a really awful violent attack by, by a serial killer, in fact, and, and she conceived. And she said that, and obviously she was deeply, deeply affected, completely traumatized, uh, as you can imagine. But she said the first time that she felt any hope again was when she had, the, uh, had a scan and found out that she was pregnant. And she says that her son has just always been such a blessing. You know, he's healed the family. He's kind of brought them back from this really, really dark place that they were in. Um, so I think it is important to be listening to, to women who've experienced this. And actually a large, large percentage of women who have conceived through rape um, have not, um, do not go on to abort. Yeah. Um, and something else that this woman said, um, which I think is really important, you know, she sees in America there's lots of kind of pro-life laws going through. And a lot of these include an exception for rape, you know, will ban abortion except in the cases of rape. And she says that just feels to her like people want to protect all children except for people like her son. Um, and I do think it's worrying where we can say people's worth is affected by how they're conceived. I mean, most of the time you don't know how somebody's conceived. There are ideal situations, there are less ideal situations, and there are very, very not ideal situations like rape, but we don't judge other people on how they were conceived. We're all equally important. Yeah, look, fair enough. I like your approach. I don't entirely agree with it, but I like the approach. I mean, for somebody who, who might become, and as you said quite correctly, it does make up a very small percentage of abortions anyway, and that's fair to say as well. But if somebody has become pregnant because of a sexual assault, I'd like them to be able to at least hear the experiences of the lady you referenced a couple of minutes ago. But what I wouldn't like to do is to compel them to to carry to term. That's just where I come in. But 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 I hear what you're saying loud and clear. Do you think it's become I don't know I don't know who you blame, whether you blame the media or whether you blame pro life or whether you blame pro choice people, but do you think this particular debate, which is hugely important I believe, for, for humanity, for people do you think it's just become ridiculously polarised now? And when it is discussed on 
television and and in, and in print, it descends into nonsense and name calling and abusive type comments rather than kind of sensible, you know, moderate. Let's have a proper discussion about it. Let's hear let's hear every voice. It's, it doesn't seem to be like that anymore. It's very polarized. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. I mean, even as you said yourself, you feel uh, sometimes uncomfortable as, as a man talking about this yeah. issue. I mean, that shouldn't be the case. You know, um, the, the core of the pro-life position really is that it's a human rights issue so that it's something that affects everyone. Um, you know, men can have an opinion on a moral issue just as much as women can. And obviously men are also affected by abortion. You know, they might be fathers of these babies. Um, men, you know, um, un- unborn boys are aborted as much as unborn girls are. Well, actually not as much, but but they are. Um, so, yeah, it is something that everyone ought to be able to talk about. And um, and I think that it needs to be a recognition that, you know, that it is a serious moral issue that people have legitimate um, kind of concerns about and, and feelings on. So when you just kind of have this, you know, you can't talk, you're a man, or you can't talk, yeah. you don't know about this, it's not helpful for anybody. No, no, it isn't. But I, 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 I kind of understand it. You know, I understand it when, when, when women talk about women's health and women's right to choose and a woman's sovereignty over her own body I understand that I know you're going to come back at me and say that and I've heard the argument before and a lot of my friends you know the people I've worked with in the media many of them would be very very sympathetic to to your position Alicia there's there's, there's, there's no two ways about that well, I want to ask you this it might be a bit cheeky it's not a loaded question are you, are you it's got nothing to do with your organisation are you a Christian woman by any chance? I am, yes. And the reason I ask you that is because this issue segues into another very important issue. Do you believe, it's not a loaded question, it's a fair question, because I'm not a Christian, I, I was raised as a Catholic, but I'm a, I'm a lapsed Catholic, I suppose, Alethea, I would say today. Um, are Christian voices being marginalised today by the media and in society in general? Is there a kind of a movement? Because I think there might be, and again, I'm not Christian, so I don't have any... I don't come down on any side here. Do you think that Christian voices and Christian ideology and Christian ideas are being kind of pushed to one side today? Yeah, I do think they are. I think it might be something that kind of affects people from all religions as well. I think perhaps um, Christian voices is maybe particularly noticeable in this country because it is at least technically the the kind of majority religion or was. Um, Though I think it does often come down to kind of moral issues like this, which um, kind of come into a Christian worldview but aren't reliant on them. So I'd say my pro-life position, well, obviously that goes with my um, my Christian beliefs. I actually I cared a lot. I cared about pro-life stuff before I cared about faith things, if that makes sense. I got a lot of it from my um, from my father, who was an atheist. Um, so I think a lot of the time the kind of idea that you can be against abortion or that you can have certain views on marriage or things like that is very much being marginalised. And those are views that often go with being religious, um, but they affect other people as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good answer that. Yeah, it's, you, your, your position is not informed by, uh, by your religion. No, but I just see it, again, as an interested observer, as somebody who isn't a practising Christian anymore. I do notice that often when these issues are discussed, the, the the pro-choice people almost kind seem to kind of kind of use Christianity or somebody's Christian beliefs as kind of a slight, uh, as if it somehow kind of weakens their uh, position. And I think with other religions or minority religions, they're very much protected. But I think in this day and age, you see a lot, you know, stuff said about Christians and Christianity and Christian beliefs that wouldn't be allowed or wouldn't be accepted if they were said about other religions, whether it be Judaism, Islam, or whatever, do you go along with that? Um, well, to be honest, I wouldn't really want to get, in, get into enough. that too much. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Um, yeah. No, I'm, it's sure, not, I'm sure a lot of people are of that view. Yeah, and it's not, it's not what we brought you on to talk about. I want to thank you for coming on today. I'm so glad that the, that horrendous decision was overturned. And I'm going to keep an eye on what it is um, you're doing, uh, Alethea, because I would love to know if we can find out what nearly happened to that young woman, um, which, again, thankfully was overturned, if it has been happening to other women. We need to know that. Uh, thanks for coming on. Alethea Williams, Communications Officer for the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. Enjoy the chat, Alethea. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Alethea Williams there on the line from uh, her home in London. Yeah. Didn't want to be drawn on the, is it okay to go after Christians? When, when discussing these more emotive subjects, like abortion and other issues. I mean, we've seen a litany, haven't we, 
of stories. More often than not, they're in the Daily Mail, which covers these stories of Christians facing, I don't want to say persecution because it's a huge word, but at least um, facing discrimination in their places of work. We've seen this. We know this, right? You get, you know, you can't wear the crucifix. You can't talk about this. You can't talk about your beliefs. I remember interviewing a nurse some years ago who was threatened with suspension because she mentioned to a patient who didn't turn out to be from an ethnic minority background, in fact, was a white patient. A nurse said, you know, as the patient was getting prepared for surgery, the nurse said, I'll say a little prayer for you. The nurse was devoutly Christian. I can't remember her name at the time. She came on my programme and was told, well, if you say that again, you'll be suspended. And I remember thinking, how could that be harmful in any way? I'm not a practising Christian, but if somebody said to me, Richie, you're going down now for that operation on your ingrowing toenail. <laughs> and I'll say a little prayer for you. I say, thanks. Thanks very much. But anyway. Anyway, it's coming up for 14 minutes to the top of the hour. I'm with you till the top of the hour, by the way. Horrendous story in the United States and Canada, speaking of children and terminations. You might have seen this this morning because I think, again, most of the TV news channels covered it. Uh, a baby girl was found alive inside a plastic bag in Georgia. Um, residents heard crying and searched out the whereabouts of the crying sounds and found a baby in a plastic bag, a baby that had just been born. Uh, the umbilical cord was still attached and the fluids were still on the baby. They took the baby into care. She's known now as Baby India. And I just thought, Jesus Christ, when I saw that, you know. How desperate things are for some people to do something like that. So that's been covered. That's a big story uh, this morning, this lunchtime as well. Um, Ian Brady. Of course, Mancunians will know all about Ian Brady. And Myra Hindley. Brady is one half of the infamous Moore's murderers. They murdered uh, Brady and Hindley a number of children in the mid-1960s and buried their bodies in the Saddleworth Moor, which is very near Manchester. Brady, then after being convicted, spent the rest of his time in prison, in uh, in a prison hospital. And it's emerged today that during his stay at Wormwood Scrubs Prison, where he was for nearly five years, he was freely able to mix with vulnerable Borstal boys. And even after one young prisoner said that Ian Brady, this sicko that's dead now, had had sex with him, no action was taken for months. For decades, Brady was known, according to the BBC, as Britain's most notorious murderer. How could a guy like Brady freely mix with young boys, have sex with one of them, and no action to be taken for months? An inquiry is bound to be ordered here. Unbelievable stuff, you know. Unbelievable stuff. And I want to talk very briefly about, I might have lost, have I lost it? I've lost it now. <laughs> I've lost it. Um, yes, I haven't lost it. Because I've covered this. You know that in Birmingham, a bunch of concerned parents are protesting against mandatory LGBT teaching for their young children. You know this. And they have continued to protest outside the school. They've been doing it since January at a couple of schools in January. I argue, and I have argued, that they are right, that their concerns are legitimate. Their children should not be subjected to this teaching. They shouldn't be talking or thinking about sex full stop or adult relationships, whether they be straight or gay or whatever the bloody hell. Now, the Education Secretary Damien Hines was on Sky News again this morning. We're very Sky News-centric with uh, Sarah Jane Mee. And she interviewed him this morning and brought up and discussed the protests by the parents. Have a listen to some of this. This is Sarah Jane Mee with the Education Secretary Damien Hines. You'll hear her first. You've said that every child must learn about gay relationships before leaving school and they're better discussed in the classroom than the playground. Yes. The schools will be strongly encouraged to do this. Um, 
I just want to ask you about that school in Birmingham, Anderton mm. Park Primary, that's been on our channel a lot because it's been the centre of the protest you can see here on your screen. We're in regular contact with Sarah Hewitt-Clarkson, who's the head teacher mm. of that school, and she said that she has invited you up to that school to talk to them, to, to see firsthand what's been going mm. on. Why haven't you taken up her invitation? Because this has been the flashpoint mm. that sparked your response to all of this yesterday. Well, sorry, no, that... We, the last thing you said isn't isn't correct. I mean, we have been we're introducing relationships, sex, and health education as mandatory subjects. Mandatory subjects. This is what it's all about. You see, the parents have no say in it. We're going to teach your four and five year olds about homosexual relationships, about sexual relationships between straight people, and we're going to talk to them about gender identity. Mandatory, and the parents have no say in it whatsoever. Subjects. Um, we had done anyway, and in fact, the protests around. Uh, the schools in Birmingham, Anderton Park, uh, in particular, that you mentioned, are not actually about that new curriculum because it hasn't hasn't come in yet. But in answer to your specific question about being in contact with the school, the Department for Education is in very very regular contact uh, with the school, with Birmingham City Council, and with and with others as well. And but the, to try and do everything we can. But, but for me, no, 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 I'm, I'm coming to that. I, 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 I you promise you, I'm, I promise them. you, I'm coming to that. Okay. Uh, every time there's a sort of high profile intervention, high profile visit uh, at that school or there was another school as well that was that had some protests previously. Whenever there's a high profile visit it tends to increase the amount of protests. It draws it draws more attention, it gives more oxygen to those protests and I don't want people protesting at or near schools. Teachers should not have to walk past protesters with loud hailers. Ah yeah yeah I don't want people protesting. Well sorry pal it's a free country. Well it isn't really. But you pretend that it is. So if people want to stand outside the school and protest because they have been ignored. You see, they want to send their children to school. Another matter entirely, of course. No child of mine would ever enter any school in this country. That's just me. They want to send their kids to school. They just want to reserve the teaching of adult things for the kids till they're a bit older. Till they're maybe in their teens. That's all they want to go to work, to do their job. Children should not have to walk past uh, protests. Bollocks. This is what... They can't... They can't legitimately... They, they can't provide any legitimate arguments against what the parents have demanded. So, the last refuge of the galactically stupid like Damien Hines is, they have to start protesting because it might affect the children. They say that because they cannot provide a cogent argument against what the parents want, which is don't talk to our very young children about this stuff, they're too young for it. Protests and protesters, okay, because it can frighten why, them. Okay, you've explained why you haven't actually... And Sarah Jane Mee is a dreadful presenter. Haven't actually physically... Because she doesn't at any time during, during the interview actually take him on, on the fundamental point, which is what the parents are protesting about in the first place. She never brings it up. Physically gone to the school. Have you, have you picked up the phone and spoken to the head teacher? I haven't no. personally spoken to... No, he hasn't. That's all she's interested in. If you spoke to the head teacher, if you spoke to the head teacher, what about have you spoke to the parents? Do you understand why the parents are horrified by mandatory education on these issues for four and five-year-olds? Do you understand that? Not a bit of it from Sky News. Coming up for six and a half minutes, seven minutes, even two... Uh, two o'clock to the top of the air. This is the Richie Allen Show. Slightly earlier today, I uh, mentioned earlier on and yesterday, we're away to a, to a concert uh, this evening. Uh, thanks for your comments. This will, of course, if you're coming in on the end of it, you might have only learned about this now. It will be repeating from about three o'clock throughout the rest of the day. So you'll get it at five o'clock as usual anyway. Yeah. Steve-O says, what a load of old bollocks the drag stuff is. Talk about drama queens. Or any other type of queens. That's referencing the young boy who went to his prom in drag. <laughs> in drag. Fair enough. And then he was then he was uh, he was anointed. He was ordained prom queen by the children who probably felt they had no choice. Cartoon drunk spoke about homeopathy on Twitter. Prince Charles has become a patron of the homeopathy faculty, hundred and seventy five years old. The medical fraternity in the UK has gone bananas. Homeopathy, says Cartoon Drunk, is not just about the diluted water treatment. 
Homeopathy is about the treatment of disease by looking at the body as a whole rather than looking at the microscopic like modern medicine does. Gail on homeopathy and on that whole argument says she had acupuncture on the NHS years ago. I did hear that before, not from you, but I did hear that at one time you could get acupuncture on the NHS back in the day. Is it still possible to get acupuncture on the NHS today? I don't know. Hmm. Does the royal household's use of homeopathy in any way explain their longevity? <laughs> I wonder. Because they don't die, these people, do they? I'm fed up of waiting for the Queen to die. <laughs> Come on. I just want to have great fun recording all the madness. All the tributes, Alistair Bruce and all that. That's, I don't wish the woman any ill will. Despise everything she stands for and represents, but I don't know her personally. And I don't spend my time wishing ill fortune on anybody because it isn't the right way. It's not the right way to be right with the universe. Don't wish bad things on people. Don't do that. Let the universe take care of people. It does in the end, I think. At least I hope it does. So I don't wish this woman any ill will. But I've been waiting for her to die for years. <laughs> Just for the crack. For all the madness. But she'll be around another 10, 15 years. I've no doubt about it. They live forever, these people. So that's it from me. I will be back with you, of course, tomorrow, Thursday at 9.30am in the AM, 9.30, with the newspaper review show again. We'll have a few giggles and we'll look through the UK's newspapers and what is inside them. We'll do that again tomorrow. I will do that tomorrow. I'm not sure about tomorrow by way of a show. I've got an appointment tomorrow. It's a personal matter. And I think it's going to take a few hours in the mid-morning to mid-afternoon. So when I finish up the paper review, I've got an appointment that I've had for a while. It's not a health thing, it's another matter, it's a private matter. And it might take up most of the day Thursday. If it does, you might not get me tomorrow. But we'll see, we'll see. We'll see, I don't like missing programmes. And I'm giving you lots extra these days anyway. So we'll see, we'll see. But uh, you, you will get me at 9.30 tomorrow. I'm going to play out the programme today with some Brian Ferry. We'll close out with some Brian Ferry. Thanks to Alethea Williams for coming on the programme from the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. Very important issue, that. And I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to um, speak to people I know in the media, in the mainstream media, to get them to follow up this. How many other women who are in perfect physical health but who might have a learning disability. How many other women have been told they must have an abortion? Terrifying that. And I want to find that out. So this programme is going to take that mantle up and try and find out that answer. Here's Brian Ferry. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. I'll speak to you tomorrow at 9.30. As I said, all right. Have a great rest of your Wednesday. A lot of very warm weather coming in the next few days as well. Must be all that global warming. See you tomorrow. Until then, bye now. Bye. Look after yourselves and one another.